Good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Can sort of see you. Um, my name is Charles Barber, or Chip Barber, most people know me at. And this session is going to focus on innovative tools and technologies for combating forest crime. Um, I'm going to give a bit of an overview presentation about some issues around the use of various tools and platforms and technologies um, in this field. And um, a short film, actually, as part of this. Um, as an example of this, and then we will move on to um, a great panel discussion. So could I invite the panelists to come up and join me here on stage? Um, Simona Bausch is the Latin America Director of Global Canopy Program. Alexander Sasha von Bismarck is the Executive Director of the Environmental Investigation Agency, or EIA. Serge Mukori is with FLAG, the Field Legality Advisory Group in Cameroon. And Flor de Maria Vega is from the Public Prosecutor's Office in Peru, where she takes charge of environmental crime. And they will be, we will be talking with, we'll then open things up later on to a bit of uh, questions. And as you're probably familiar with the routine by now, you can go on the app. And starting right now, you can submit any questions that we will then put up on, they will be selected by our panel of experts down front here um, to put some questions up later on about an hour into the session. So try to keep them pithy and punchy. They can be statements or they can be, uh, they can be questions, but just keep them fairly short. So, onward to the presentation. Um, let's see. In a second. Ah, very good. Everyone can see? So that's local hero. Edvard Munch, one of his forest paintings. Um, and this is what we're going to talk about, tools and technologies to promote legality, traceability, and transparency. Um, what are the options and the opportunities, and what are the challenges as we deal with trying to stop forest crime and better manage tropical forests? So to start off, I just wanted to make three points to consider. I guess my main point here is that technology by itself doesn't really do anything, and you can't choose technologies without knowing what it is you want to do first. So you need appropriate focused technology. And just three key points to think about in three forest spaces. No, first, I the first is that the, the useful choice among, Wait, among oh, tools recién. and technologies to combat forest crime. Recién, recién, ahorita. Huh. That's weird. <laughs> Anyway, the, use, the useful choice among tools and technologies to combat forest crime requires a well-thought-out strategy and the considered choice of your tactics first. You need to think about this before you think about the different tools and technologies. Second, uh, the effective application of any of these tools and technologies we'll be talking about is dependent on the political and institutional environment. The very simple example is if the courts are corrupt, it doesn't matter how strong the evidence is. It's not going to help you, so collecting strong evidence in a corrupt court system not going to do you much good. Third, tools and technologies must be appropriate to the settings where they're used. And I mean some of the physical and technological settings. Do you have internet connectivity? What kind of technical capacities and facilities are there? Clouds and rain and mud and humidity and things like that can also have a great effect. Things that work in the lab don't necessarily work in the field. So in figuring out what you want to do, what tools you want to deploy, you've got to ask the right questions. And not everyone will ask all of these questions, but the first one, a set of questions around, what is it that you want to know? Are particular forest areas being fragmented or cut or burned or cleared? What particular activities are causing the damage that you're seeing? Who's directly responsible? Who's doing it? You might already know all of that, though, and have more sophisticated questions, more, you know, harder to find out. Who's really benefiting along the supply chain um, for this wood or forest, forest product? Who's financing it? What species is a particular confiscated specimen? Where on earth is it from? Um, and who are the end markets and consumers, and how does it get there? Second set of questions is around who are you and what's your objective? Are you just trying to figure out if particular cutting is legal or not, or clearing? Are you defending your territory, an indigenous territory perhaps, or a protected area? Are you trying to exclude material from a supply chain? Are you trying to show that your company is really legally compliant with whatever it's, it's agreed to do and has to do under the law? Are you trying to find offenders in the field and arrest them, maybe in law enforcement? Are you trying to find illegal material in ports and other forms of transit? 
Are you, um, you know, a crime fighter trying to smash a transnational network of criminals? Are you doing a name and shame kind of approach? You want to identify a wrongdoer who could be a government or a company or whomever? Are you trying to pressure a company to reform its practices? Or maybe there are really bad guys and you want to put them out of business. Um, it could be any of those and other things, but you need to have a strategy in mind. So moving to the various types of technologies, on the ground, what I call perimeter defense, the things you do on the ground in the forest to try and detect and apprehend and defend against those who are trying to cut the forest illegally or clear it. Um, there's a lot of talk here. There's, there's a whole other session on remote sensing. We're all well familiar with that and how the prices have come down, and it's a lot e easier to use that, to use that kind of stuff. Um, there's drones, um, mobile GPS things. There's handheld devices are getting quite popular now. This is the Forest Watcher app that's being used where you can use offline, collect data in the field, use maps and things. Camera traps are usually used for wildlife, but they can be used for trucks and other things. Those are becoming much more sophisticated. The batteries are getting much better. Uh, there are even audio listening devices that don't rely on visual stimulation. This guy is doing a lot of that, looking for, you, you can listen for chainsaws and many other things out in the forest. In the end, it kind of depends on direct action, uh, though. The, you, you know, putting these tools together on the ground in particular areas to defend a territory. That's the Kayapo territory in the center of the map there. And you can see they've done a reasonably good job against all the incursions there in Brazil. Um, when you begin to look at material in supply chains, moving through a supply chain, um, there are several things that you might want to know. That piece of timber there has a barcode, or there's also a new nanotechnology kind of a coding system from a company called Stardust that's quite interesting. But you're trying to figure out did the material that came from a forest end up in a place where it went? Is it actually what it says it is? So there's a lot of systems for actually tracing the material, making that secure. There's a lot of documentation issues, those too. How do you know that the papers that are going along with that, are they, have they been falsified, are they the real thing? A lot of interest in blockchain technologies as a more secure way of taking care of the security of the documentation of a supply chain. Um, you might have a particular specimen of wood, and you might want to know what, what is this? It, you know, what species is it, and where did it come from? One thing that's quite useful is wood anatomy, which is probably the most traditional. You're looking at the patterns in the wood. Um, here's a few pictures of how it's done. Um, and you're comparing it. If you, the, the, the slide before showed a kind of machine vision version of that, where you automate that a bit, like facial recognition. So this is uh, sort of the standard. Um, there are different chemical methods, though, where you're actually looking at chemical properties of a piece of wood and figuring out based on that and re referring it to a reference supply, a, a reference database, what it is and maybe where it comes from. An example of that is mass spectrometry, which is machines are kind of expensive, but it's quite cheap to do, where you're getting this little chemical signature and you can compare it to, to your database and say, OK, this is rosewood from Madagascar, this is something else. Um, you can do this with isotopes within, within the wood as well. There are things like isotopes in water and um, in, 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 um, in geological materials, which allow you to see where something is from. This won't tell you what species it is. That's ironwood in Africa, Iroko, and you can see that if you do this analysis, you can see whether it's from, from West or Central Africa fairly, fairly clearly. There are a bunch of DNA methods I won't talk about a lot, but they are doing the same thing, looking at the makeup in, in the particular wood of its genes and comparing it again to a reference database. Um, moving into the, the, the overall supply chain, there's a lot of anti-smuggling measures. We heard yesterday in one of them, there's millions of containers around the world. How do you pick the ones that you're going to look at? Because you can't inspect them all. So. I call these anomaly algorithms, way of sorting through these millions of things and finding things that stand out that make you look in one container that it might have something suspicious in it. Um, there are sniffer dogs. They've been used a lot for wildlife, like this dog here with the ivory in his mouth, but they're used for wood, too. And there's, there's a lot of interesting work going on around that as a way of finding what's going on in the port. Um, some places x-ray everything. This is in Thailand, where they x-ray all the containers and they x-ray all of the train cars. And those are two cases, one that was declared as tea and it had ivory in it. The other one was declared as charcoal and it was filled with rosewood. Um, it's pretty expensive. That's a huge port, the largest port in Thailand. There are ways to track ships. There are lots of databases and ways that you can tell in real time where ships are. This was a case relating to Madagascar. That can be very useful as well as you're trying to 
figure where things have gone. And finally, the last bit of things is there's a lot of new technologies around the crunching of big data um, to, to help you connect the dots amongst all these things when you're trying to figure out who's cutting the wood, who's buying it, who's selling it, where is it going. Um, the sort of four categories here I'll run through real quick. The supply chain and trade data analysis, there's a lot of that going on here. We're going to hear about that a bit in more detail from Simona is going to talk about Trace, which is an interesting effort to do this with some uh, forest risk sorts of commodities like soy. Um, you have a lot of corporate and financial research. That paper at the top on the left there is available. There was a session on, on this yesterday, how do you use the management of big data to figure out who's financing uh, and you know operations that are destroying forests. Um, there's a lot of people who have done this in the sort of sh activist short selling space as well on Wall Street and other places. Um, this is another example of that, of that kind of material. This is a brand new report that was put out in Indonesia where you're figuring out who owns what <laughs> when something is, is going wrong. It's a lot easier to do this than it used to be. And it's getting cheaper. Finally, mapping and disrupting the criminal networks. There are a lot of new technologies. That's a Palantir on the right. It's a kind of a fairly sophisticated software for helping you map and figure out the relationships amongst people in criminal networks. Um, final, we, we have all these social networks everywhere, and you can mine the data. These are some particularly brazen timber and wildlife thieves in Thailand who keep on posting pictures of themselves with bags of money <laughs> and, and their illegal timber all over Facebook and YouTube and things like this. this. This didn't require any hacking or anything. This was just getting a Thai avatar and going in there and friending them and then seeing all their stuff while they boast about the money that they launder and things like that and the Cartier things that they're buying or Chanel, I guess that is. Um, and now, I'm not sure how this is going to work. The last one I wanted to talk about, this is a film that was just shown yesterday or two days ago. It was made in Indonesia and Papua and this is just to show how low cost and easy it is to make films and get them out there on YouTube and places like that. So hopefully that's going to work. Sarmi. Sebuah tempat yang kaya akan hutan dan pantai Tapi mungkin itu dulu Sebelum tempat ini mengalami pemekaran Dan menerima perusahaan hutan Masuk ke wilayah kita Setelah itu semua terjadi Banyak pula hidup masyarakat setempat yang berubah Karena hutan yang selama ini menjadi rumah mereka Terancam hilang Kita kasih bebas untuk perusahaan masuk Berarti itu punah Pokoknya semua Aktivitas masyarakat itu paling yang berburu cari binatang ya untuk hidup atau berburu itu paling tidak dapat. Memang kita dulu itu sudah sampai jalan keluar jauh tapi ya kita pagi siang sudah di rumah sampai kita nak PH masuk. binatang-binatang Kalau mengharap tergantung bisnis isi itu terus, utang ini habis. Jangan pikir dengan kita kita sekarang. Kita kita sekarang kan besok besok kita, kita sudah tidak ada. Tapi anak cucu kita besok ini mau bangun rumah dengan apa? Mungkin kita lupa rusaknya setiap hutan adalah awal dari berakhirnya kehidupan kita. Kehidupan di tempat kita tinggal, kehidupan di bumi. Yang telah menjadi rumah untuk kita Jadi Apakah kita masih mau Merusak rumah kita sendiri
So I showed that to you in part. I mean, it's an interesting film and very well done, but this was made for very low cost and without having a huge amount of technical expertise. It's a new technology that 25, 30 years ago, you wouldn't have been able to do this or to, or to distribute it. So going back to um, presentations, just a couple more slides. Yeah, so I guess one big point to end with is that um, all this knowledge and data and information by itself is not power. Sometimes people say knowledge is power. I don't believe that. I think what Frederick Douglass, famous 19th century abolitionist, said is the truth that power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. Um, and what Francis said in, in the opening yesterday morning about anesthesia, I, I added, because I like that, that consciousness and awareness with paralysis is pretty scary and it's pretty futile and it doesn't really do anything. So we need to turn this into action. And it's not like there's so much at stake, just the earth. Um, so with that, I thought we'd turn to the questions. I'm finished on time here. That's very good. And um, there are basically two questions I would like to put to our panelists um, in two rounds, and then we'll open it up. And I guess the first is on looking across this range of technologies and platforms and tools and things that have really come into being in the last 20, 25 years, um, which ones do you think are useful, are you already using perhaps in your work, and how could they be more useful in reaching your objectives? And you, and you come from very different backgrounds, looking at big data, looking at prosecution, an advocacy organization, investigative and advocacy, on the ground, field investigations and monitoring. So um, just g give us three minutes or so of your key thoughts on that. Um, we'll start with you, Serge. Well, yes. We'll just go down uh, the line. Okay. Thank, thank you, Chief, for giving me the floor. Uh, Field Legality Advising Group is a civil society organization based in Congo Basin and working in the Congo Basin country. So in our activities, we use a, we are not bind to a single tool or technology, but we, we combine them because we are doing monitoring, forest monitoring activities on the field and we use a large range of tools and technology in, to be in order to, to produce uh, reliable data. Depending on the stage of the investigation in which we are involved, we will go from uh, uh, satellite, satellite images to, to be able to identify an area where we uh, uh, guessed there is something happening and uh, uh, in the following stage, or when we are planning our activities, we will use such technologies, just as uh, Global Forest Watch, Atlas, and things like that, to identify and point out things to see and to investigate on the field. The second aspect in which, uh, uh, the second stage in which we, we use tools and uh, different technology is the investigation itself when we go on the field and try to find out what is going on. There we use uh, uh, GPS, G-Tracks, and uh, other things like that, and even GIS, because in some cases when we, you, you want to point out, for example, uh, 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 logging outside of boundary, you, you need uh, information before and after the field. So once preparations or planning and investigations are up, we need to publish information. And to publish information, we also use some platforms that help us to, to be able to, 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 to reach a large uh, 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 public. So for example, now uh, uh, in, in Cameroon, because it has been tested in Congo and uh, in uh, DRC, now we are we will work with uh, WRI to, to promote the, the open timber portal or to customize it for Cameroon, for example. And it is a platform that will help us to, to reach a, a large uh, uh, public in order to, 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 to send our information and uh, report because you know, uh, uh, field mission reports are sometimes uh, uh, written in such a way that it, the information is not accessible to, to everybody. So with this platform, we will be, we will be able to, to transform and to, 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 to transform the information so that uh, it reaches a, a, a large 
public. So cheap. these are some examples uh, of how we use uh, uh, different types of tools at different stages of our activities to be able to produce data that will help government or the, the public in general to know what is going on the field. We use it in, in forest monitoring activities, but we, we can also use them on the general uh, uh, natural resource management monitoring. So uh, uh, I think for, for, for this first round, uh, it's That's um, good, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's worth noting that in, in some of the countries in Congo Basin, the reason this goes on, part of it is because of the FLEG-T processes going on, the, um, you know, the voluntary partnership agreements, which have given a space for this, and the fact that the governments in at least DRC and ROC have agreed to supply some of the key information to make it public about, say, where logging concessions are and things like this, which allows one then to go out and monitor what's going on against the baseline of management plans and things like that. Sasha. Sure Thanks. Many yeah, things. Serge, I'm glad that you mentioned the, the open timber portal because I think when things get really exciting is when the tools come together to create platforms or other mechanisms that actually give us a new system of governance in the forest as opposed to uh, individual examples of, of finding cases of illegal logging and, and so forth. We, we use just about all the technologies that you listed, Chip, um, in specific cases. The first case, first major prosecution under the U.S. Lacey Act used the isotope uh, technology to show that the oak uh, came from the Russian Far East and not from Germany. But the, the example I want to highlight now is, is another example of where if you add these tools together and combine it with the right political will, that then we could have seismic shifts in actually the, the form of governance on the ground, the empowerment of people like uh, those shown in the video. And so I, I'll paint a quick picture of something to which the punchline will be that this is already happening, um, to give that away at the beginning. But imagine that you were driving behind a logging truck and you are who you are, uh, an interested person, maybe a tourist or a citizen of that country. You're driving behind a logging truck and you, uh, uh, hopefully without causing an accident, take down the license plate of that truck and enter it in an app or, or call in that license plate. And a central system will immediately give you a response of whether that truck is legal or not. If it's illegal, you automatically, without any other action of your own, the police will be called to the scene. You can, if you choose, continue to drive and watch that logging truck being pulled over on the side of the road, their papers being checked. Um, if it turns out it's illegal, you will see that truck being impounded. If you are a civil society group doing investigations, um, you could you know, sit in a cafe over a month and just watch logging trucks go by, look on a website, and for each truck going by, you could see exactly where it came from, what species of wood it's supposed to be carrying, that it registered it was carrying, um, at what time it left, what the volume is, where it's going, what concession it came from. So you could create immediate reports that is tracking how much wood is coming, say, from an area immediately around a national park where you are concerned that uh, cutting that is maybe pretending it's, it's cutting legally in a buffer zone is actually coming from a national park. This is all what is currently the reality in Romania, in Europe. And it's been fully implemented now for two years. And uh, after this was launched, um, you had about 60,000 people download this app. And you had an entire population of a country become aware of it. There were big news um, reports on it. So you were empowering an entire population of a country to be part of the governance of their forest. Um, because there was so much participation, the number of trucks that were registered, that were legal, meaning the number of trucks that actually told everybody that they had just logged and moved wood from one place to another went up by 50% within a month. So, you know, half or 50% more trucks were actually removing wood um, before, before this app was launched. Our estimate is that illegal logging rates have been reduced by at least 50%. 
the major companies there that had been acting with impunity have now been raided across the country and are under investigation for organized crime and fraud of the, of the entire country for, for the taxes associated with the wood. So it is really a sea change in the amount of, of visibility of what is happening in the forest the empowerment of all the actors, all the stakeholders that should be part of, of the management of the forest. And I think it, to Chip's point, is I think the most exciting example where we now have a chance to combine new tools that really lower the, the price and in, increase the possibilities of, of what is possible with real demand for change and therefore political will, which, which so many in this room have worked to create. Uh, through demand-side laws that demand in the international market actually legal wood for the first time um, for via zero deforestation commitments for commodities, all of that potential pressure and, and incentive to produce legal wood. The question is what is that, how is that going to express itself and change on the ground? And I think if you combine them with some of these new tools, um, we can really cause the, the kind of seismic change that, that we've been challenged to, to come up with while we're here. Thanks, that's, that's, that's a great example. Um, Flora, you come at this from a very different place in a position in the public prosecutor's office. I know Peru has been very active in trying to deploy a lot of traceability and remote sensing capabilities and I'd be very interested to hear your perspective about um, where are the opportunities there. Primero agradecer al gobierno de Noruega por esta invitación. Luego ponerles en contexto lo que es la fiscalía en, el, en Perú. Nosotros como tenemos 61 despachos de fiscales a nivel de Latinoamérica y de, de Sudamérica, somos los, el país que tiene más fiscales especializados en la investigación de delitos ambientales. Y nosotros tenemos que darles a ellos las herramientas para poder hacer una buena investigación y lograr que nuestros casos lleguen a buen puerto, es decir, lograr sentencias condenatorias que al final serán disuasivas de quienes cometen estos delitos de tala ilegal o de desbosque. En la Fiscalía nos, no, nosotros recientemente tenemos cuatro unidades geo de satelitales, de monitoreo satelital, que han sido donados por Estados Unidos a través de USAID dos de ellas, una en el 2015, en mayo, otra en el 2016, en diciembre, y dos que hemos recibido de Noruega a través de ACA, una en enero del 2017 y, y otra hace una semana exactamente, que está funcionando en Lima. Las otras tres están en las áreas amazónicas, como Loreto, como Madre de Dios y Pucalpa, que son las zonas de mayor desbosque. Madre de Dios, que todos conocemos de repente por las noticias, que es la más afectada por el tema de la minería ilegal. Y la, Loreto y, y Pucalpa, el tremendo, la deforestación por la tala ilegal. Tenemos que dar a los fiscales los, las herramientas. A través de estas herramientas, los fiscales conocen, a través de los ingenieros que trabajan en estas unidades, dónde se está desboscando, porque de manera de, de ellos de oficio pueden hacer la, la búsqueda a través de los satélites y llegar en un operativo en compañía de la policía, que es especializada también para materia ambiental, con, las, con los organismos que trabajan este tipo de investigación, como son los administrativos, porque nosotros en este tema tenemos leyes en blanco y tenemos que acudir a otras instituciones para poder de esta manera nosotros probar y nuestro delito, para poder llevar a, a juicio a quienes están involucrados en, el, en los desbosques o en los delitos de tala ilegal. Entonces, el ingeniero hace un mapeo y le informa al fiscal y le dice, señor fiscal, está, hemos visto que hay desbosque, y de manera oficial el, el fiscal va en compañía de la policía y podemos hacer operativos porque están desboscando, ya sea para tala ilegal, hemos encontrado también para sembríos de coca o para minería ilegal. Entonces, es importante 
para nosotras estas unidades que han sido donadas y también tenemos el uso de los drones. El uso de los drones es que realmente recién se nos han donado y que estamos sin utilizarlos todavía porque hay que hacer un curso, hay que estudiar, hay que tener una licencia. Ya están los ingenieros prestos a poder tener esta licencia. La próxima semana están ya dando el examen y con estos drones nosotros vamos a poder llegar a zonas que es imposible llegar. La Amazonía peruana es tan amplia que no podemos llegar a tiempo a veces a a verificar estos desbosques y con la ayuda de los drones vamos a poder eh, trabajarlos. Pero también tengo que decir que tenemos limitación en, est en, estos, en estas pruebas porque todavía no, no los tenemos en protocolo para poderlas nosotros presentar en un proceso y que sean admitidas sin ninguna objeción de, la, de parte de los abogados o de quienes están siendo procesados. Eso es en cuanto a la tecnología. También hacemos uso del GPS también y nosotros pretendemos crear una app para que los fiscales tengan el, la relación de todas las maderas que hay en el país. Y es, esto se está utilizando en Colombia y nosotros pretendemos y hemos iniciado ya, el, la, tenemos la idea ya de trabajar y conseguir esta app para que los fiscales no tengan que esperar la información que le va a dar la entidad administrativa, que a veces demora un mes o más, y ellos puedan agilizar los procesos. En Perú tenemos muchos procesos por, por desbosque para el, para el sembrío, de, por ejemplo, de la palma aceitera. El desbosque en diferentes zonas, en una, en una zona ha sido 7.000 hectáreas, en otra zona 7.500, en Pucalpa 6.500, en Loreto 1.850. Todas estas desbosques están relacionados con el, con el procesado Melca, que es conocido también porque ha, está procesado en otros países por el mismo tipo de desbosque para el sembrío de la palma aceitera. Entonces, Estamos en el día a día nosotros buscando herramientas para entregar a nuestros fiscales y que ellos puedan de tener la prueba suficiente y que no sea cuestionada en un proceso y poder llegar y, y llevar a los, a los involucrados y lograr sus sentencias. Ese es el trabajo que tenemos nosotros como fiscales. Well, thank you very much. That's fascinating and good to hear of all that progress. It's kind of a good segue talking about palm oil, I think, there, to what Simona is going to talk about a little bit. Um, and these have been mainly tracking on the ground sorts of technologies and GPS. And I know what Trace is doing is more looking at these larger flows. It's the point of crunching the trade data to narrow things down. And uh, so perhaps you could give us a little insight into that, because as we all know from the last day or so and before, there's a lot of problems with illegal logging for timber, but a lot of the clearing is going on, as we just heard, for other things, for agricultural commodities, mining, even illegal drugs. So please, Simone. Yeah, as, as you were saying, I mean, most of deforestation in the world happens for the production of a handful of uh, forest risk commodities, as we call them. So the big question is, can we actually know who is doing what in which place? And that's the starting point for Trace. And actually linking the actors that are on the ground doing the deforestation, but also the companies along the supply chain that are also involved, even if indirectly. And finally, the consumer countries, um, because most of these uh, ex are actually exported to other countries. So on Trace, we basically combine different data sets in innovative ways to triangulate and actually get to, the, to, to name the actors that are active um, on jur in jurisdictions and where do they actually sell to. So we started with Brazilian soy. We uh, currently on the platform have the mapping of uh, all soy export flows from municipalities in Brazil all the way to the importing countries. Um, this means that we can also link the actors to the characteristics of the places they source from. So uh, we know, for example, how much uh, direct soy deforestation happened in each municipality, and then we attribute 
um, proportionally to the volume of soy they purchased in each place. So basically you get a mapping of, of a deforestation footprint of each company and then uh, the idea is that the, the burden of proof shifts from uh, just from jurisdictions and trying to reduce their deforestation, but actually to the actors that benefit or profit from this deforestation. So um, today we are actually launching the, the first yearbook, uh, Trace years yearbook here, which fo is, a, is a, um, the first analysis of actually comparing uh, deforestation footprints uh, of both importing countries and also of traders of soy in Brazil uh, to be able to, to see how the sourcing patterns and the, the uh, procurement uh, decisions of these companies actually influence places on the ground. So as I said, we started with Brazilian soy. We also have Paraguayan soy and our vision is to cover 70% of deforestation risk commodities by 2020. So that means uh, palm oil in Indonesia, for example, is, is coming down as are a combination of, of other commodities. And this is all publicly, freely available on the website. So the idea is to have this information uh, be available as widely as possible for as many users uh, that could use these, um, the, this information. And finally, I think that it's also very important to, to consider that there are companies and countries that are, um, are, are making commitments to reduce deforestation. Uh, for example, the New York Declaration of Forests or the Amsterdam Declaration. And we can also track the footprints and how these countries or companies are actually shifting their decisions and their impacts on the ground. So that's also quite interesting for us in terms of not just tracking the bad guys, but also how are the, the, the leaders of the pack acting. So I think that, that our vision is to encompass a, a bigger group of actors to sort of, uh, link everyone into the chain and res uh, having the responsibilities be divided into, so it's not just the government trying to prosecute, but you also have um, consumers knowing that the, the soy they buy from ha has deforestation in it, for example. Thank you. Well, that's a great range of tools and technologies being put into action and I think shows a bit of what I tried to say in the beginning is that we have s somewhat different purposes, all maybe coming together, but different pieces of the puzzle and working in different parts of the world. For a second round, um, I wanted you to sort of look on the glass half empty side of things, and fairly briefly, because we want to leave time for, for the questions, but think about, you know, if this is all so great and these things are working so well, we're not solving the problems and there's not a lot of scaling up and uptake of this. What are some of the key barriers, whether they be technological or political or information, that keep this from taking this up to scale. It's uh, obviously there's been some good success, but we're still not solving the problem in the world. And just before we start, to remind all of you in the audience that this would be a very good time to submit pithy questions and comments by way of the app. Um, and our friends Lisa and Frida in the front here, and I should thank you too from EIA and from here at Norad and Nikvi for helping us to get this all all together, we'll be sorting through those, and as soon as we finish this round, we'll put some some some, some things up on the on, on the board. So, Sarah, just start with you again. But on um, what? Oops. What needs to be fixed? What what needs to be done to scale this up and to actually make the approach you take really take off even further? Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief, for giving me the floor again. Yeah. Uh, um, from our own perspective as uh, uh, independent monitors, uh, we think that uh, one of the big challenges uh, is to be able to, first of all, uh, uh, try to, 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 to be able to, to manage all those tools. So we need capacity because uh, uh, using uh, uh, satellite data and uh, satellite images and uh, all be able to, to, to read satellite images, you, you need some capacity. Some, another challenge is to, to have funds to run or to, to, to have access to, to, to those technological or tools, uh, uh, to those technology or tools. Because uh, um, for the past five, five years, we've 
realize that funding for independent monitoring activities are, are decreasing while the need of monitoring is increasing. So, especially in the uh, Congo Basin, we need funds to be able to run uh, activities and to be able to, 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 to have or to, to access to all those tools that exist. We also need uh, uh, something which is becoming uh, uh, a, a, I don't know, uh, um, which is becoming a, a subject of discussion is that there are many tools. We have tools that are developed by international NGOs uh, such as mm -hmm. WRI, EIA, but you also have a, a local NGOs who develop uh, uh, their own tools that are adapt uh, to the uh, local context. And the, 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 to, we need to be able to have a, a, a to build complementary, complementarity or link, to be able to link those tools that we use on the ground. Because it's useless if uh, uh, each of the actors in uh, his uh, own small area try to build something that he would use just there without knowing what is going on uh, uh, out of his uh, context. Mm -hmm. So I think that all those elements, all those elements will really help to scale up the, 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 the use of technology in monitoring, uh, acting in mon forest monitoring activities because we need uh, uh, all those elements to, to, to be able to, to have everybody on board mm -hmm. because the question of uh, uh, legality and transparency will be worthless if we are not able to have uh, uh, all the stakeholders in the same direction. And for the monitoring, uh, 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 for the independent monitors, one element that the always or they would always need is to have data that are reliable so that the information published will lead to uh, uh, some change on the field. That's what I think. So. Great, thank you. It's, it's worth mentioning in Indonesia, they've set up recently an independent forest monitoring fund to try and break the link between dependence on one donor or another to try to create a central it doesn't have much money yet, the FAO puts some in, which is nice, but the idea is to have something that would provide more longer-term security of funding for the grassroots independent forest monitoring organization. So hopefully that will be a good model. Uh, Sasha, your half-empty glass. Mm. Um, well, picking up on what Serge said, I think that the, if, if, we need, if we want to connect these things to actually change systems, then one player that needs to really participate are, are the governments, and the governments need to uh, be part of a change towards transparency and traceability. And, you know, it's not difficult to think that why that's been difficult so far. It's, it's scary to, to commit to transparency, but probably because it is an effective um, combatant of corruption would be one key example. But the, the opportunity now is that the, the um, cost of, of creating that transparency has gone way down. The actual requirement of the system I described, the core requirement is simply that there is a regulation in the government that says that before you start moving wood, the, the truck driver in that case needs to have a smartphone and needs to enter their travel permit, and everybody needs to have a travel permit under existing regulation in just about every country in the world before you start moving wood or indeed any commodities. So if you'd simply have the commitment that uh, before commodities and wood are moved, there is a real-time entry of what you have, how much you have, into a smartphone that then creates that permit that is linked to a central system right away, um, you have a totally new level of, of what you can see in the forest. You know, our, our fundamental challenge is that the forest is a big, sort of quiet, dark place where you don't know what's, what's happening. And we can really change that if the government makes these certain tweaks. You need a central system in this case. You need a database at sort of a one-time cost. Um, you don't need cell phone coverage. A cell phone has GPS built into it. So if you have the requirement that you plug in your information before you start moving, 
When you hit the first town that has cell phone coverage, that information gets, gets uploaded into a central system. And then anybody that sees that truck moving can check whether it's actually registered or not. Um, I think you, know, you, you don't need a, to put a new GPS in every truck. You can basically Uberize, if you will, the movement of commodities and indeed the governance of a forest. Think about that first step in the empowerment of a community like, like we saw in the video. A key thing we're wrestling with is communities who um, have a incredibly onerous requirements by a government in terms of what their management plan actually is if they want to sustainably harvest um, a, a precious wood at a very limited amount it's really difficult to set up your management plan and then often you're forced to bring in a large company who uh, can take advantage of you and log illegally imagine if uh, communities were empowered with uh, through smartphone mechanism to manage their own forest which would be empowering and at the same time create far more transparency. You could see real time the measuring of trees. You would have the marking of trees in GPS that is very difficult to fake because you're doing it while holding a device that has a GPS in it that is now far, far cheaper. Um, so I think that's, that's an extraordinary opportunity if we all uh, direct, and I think this is why the glass is half empty still, direct the the leverage that there is um, to the same thing, which is uh, true transparency at the beginning. Because if we, it's so important what, what Trace is doing so that we see what company that has a zero deforestation policy is actually getting and whether they're sticking to their promise. But what is the first bit of information? Is it true or not? Because otherwise we're tracing illegal wood that we think is legal. So that first moment when it's cut down, do we have the commitment by the government that that is done in a transparent way? And I think now because of these technologies that's actually possible, and I think we all need to sort of come together to ask governments to do that and to help um, independent monitors be, be part of the solution. Great, thanks. Well, this would be a good time to ask the government of Peru <laughs> to have here. What are the challenges that you face in making this go forward? Um, you know, we, we've heard this, that there's some good things going on in Peru, but I know there's still a long way to go. So what are the key priorities you see that make things work better? Los problemas que nosotros enfrentamos en Perú es la normatividad. Este, por ejemplo, Lo que, más, lo que más nos preocupa es la corrupción que existe dentro de nuestro país. En el tema de deforestación y en el tema de tala ilegal, hay información que se deben entregar desde los gobiernos regionales y desde, el gobierno de, desde el, la entidad principal, como es ERFOR, respecto a las informaciones de estos lugares donde se está extrayendo madera. Pero la corrupción es tan grande que la documentación que acompaña a, a, las, a los transportes de la madera es falsa. Ese mismo documento se ha repetido uno a diez veces y los sellos se vuelven a poner porque es una cadena de corrupción que existe. Entonces, en el país no se, no se ha hecho hasta ahora, por ejemplo, no se ha acordado ya dentro de las instituciones administrativas determinar la trazabilidad de la madera desde su origen hasta la exportación o salida de la, de la madera. Tenemos, este es el más grande problema que tenemos dentro de, de Perú, este y la corrupción relacionada con la trazabilidad de la madera, de tal manera que los fiscales tenemos una problemática muy fuerte al respecto. Eh, sin embargo, yo creo que Si empoderamos a los fiscales y los preparamos a todos para el conocimiento de esta nueva tecnología, porque de los 161 fiscales que tenemos entre fiscales provinciales y adjuntos, solo 10 fiscales conocen bien el, el, cómo trabajan estas unidades georreferenciales y cómo nos pueden ayudar. Y yo creo que tenemos que capacitar a más fiscales para que tengan un conocimiento pleno. Además, nosotros con esta nueva unidad georreferencial que tenemos en Lima, vamos a tener una plataforma que se está trabajando ya, donde nosotros vamos a trabajar directamente con las instituciones administrativas y vamos a, a colgar toda la información en esta, de tal manera que 
los fiscales van a saber si es verdad que ese camión que está pasando, que dice que sacó la madera de tal concesión, es real que la sacaron de ahí, porque Osinfor nos va a informar si es que es verdad que esa, esa madera ha salido de ese espacio y Serfor también nos va a dar la información precisa, OEFA, con todas las instituciones que trabajamos. Entonces, al tener ya los fiscales la oportunidad de, de manera inmediata poder entrar a esta plataforma a través de sus teléfonos celulares, ¿no? eh, vamos a poder trabajar de manera mucho más rápida y eficiente y vamos a poder perseguir estos delitos de deforestación y de tal ilegal que existe tanto en el país y que ha traído como consecuencia que podamos hacer una, diversas intervenciones. Por ejemplo, en el año 16 se hizo un operativo bastante grande en la ciudad de Pucallpa, que, le pus, que se le denominó los patrones de, de Ucayali. ¿no? Ahí se detuvieron a 18 personas, todas involucradas en la entrega de, de documentación falsa para el traslado de madera. También en el 2017, en julio del año pasado, se hizo otro operativo bastante fuerte en la selva central que se denominó los castores de la selva central. Era toda una familia solo encargada de conseguir documentación falsa para que se, la madera ilegal que había sido eh, talada en las zonas protegidas de nuestro país saliera como si se hubiera sacado de una concesión. Es, estos señores, tenemos detenidos a ocho hasta ahora, todavía estamos en proceso. Por nuestro lado, nosotros hemos tenido intervenciones grandes como en el 2015 tuvimos un caso fuerte también de, de, de corrupción, digamos, de una embarcación que nosotros la detuvimos y donde habían 9 millones 600 mil metros cúbicos de madera ilegal. Entonces, no, nosotros lo que queremos es que nuestros fiscales, porque yo estoy hablando a, eh, en nombre de ellos, ¿no?, es que ellos estén empoderados en el conocimiento y en el uso de estas modernidades para que de manera eficiente y rápida puedan ellos eh, perseguir el delito y lograr de esta manera poner un coto a esta situación de delitos ambientales que en lugar de detenerse está aumentando. Eso creo que lo vamos a lograr con el apoyo y capacitaciones en el uso de estas, de estas nuevas tecnologías. Y también debemos de dotarlos de esos GPS que ellos necesitan y dotarlos de, de otras herramientas modernas para que puedan a, en, de manera eficiente y rápida trabajar las investigaciones. Where do you see the biggest needs and priorities for moving ahead and getting over barriers and things for the work that you do? Yeah, I'd like to mention two challenges. First of all, it's very technical, but it's just that we rely on publicly available data to make the mapping and trace. So the better the data, the better the mapping, the more reliable it is. So we do rely on uh, this public information and with all the the movements to make uh, public information available, that's always good to hear and it enhances our ma mapping capacities, but there's still quite a ways to go, especially in, as countries are in different levels of disclosure. The second is to echo uh, some of my, my panel uh, members here. And basically, transparency is disruptive by nature, so it's not like everyone loves Trace. We've, we've had <laughs> different audiences uh, react differently to Trace. Uh, and I think the main, is, the main challenge is how to capitalize on this disruption to actually prove good use of land. So as it is right now, we, we paint everyone in the same color based on how much soy, in this case, you buy from a certain place. But obviously co uh, companies differ from each other in terms of their production methods or whether they actually uh, clear land for soy or not. So how can we actually get companies to disclose information about where they source from to actually get this, uh, I mean, to be able to differentiate the good guys from the bad guys. So I think that this, uh, and that applies to governments as well. I mean, how, what are your policies? What are your sustainability targets? What are your enforcement targets that you can actually prove that you are trying your best to, to promote sustainable uh, commodity production? Great, thank you very much. Um, well. 
Now we're going to turn it over to you in the audience. I don't know what the technology is. Uh, Frida is nodding. And we can put some questions up there. Well, we have the iguana back. He appears quite often here. Good. Um, and I think what we'll do is let's put a question up. I will read it out so it gets translated. Okay, the question is, knowing that the threats against environmental activists are very real in most tropical forests, does new technology make um, the work easier and safer for activists, or can it expose the activists to increased danger as they become a more serious threat to the actors involved in illegal deforestation? A good provocative question. Would anyone on the panel like to have, have a go at that? Sure, I think it'll be important to hear. Yeah. Their mistake. So you're out there in the field doing it. Yeah. You tell us. Well, yes, right yes. Uh, uh, thanks for, for that question. Well, I, personally, I think that new, techno new technology uh, may uh, help to protect uh, uh, forest activists because uh, now you, you are able to investigate uh, uh, without even being directly in contact with the, 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 the operators or the, the illegal loggers. You have the, the possibility because uh, a few months ago in uh, Congo uh, uh, Republic, we tested uh, uh, investigation with drones, for example. It's just, it was just a test. Huh? It's not uh, yet a, a common practice in, in the area. But this is an example where technology helps or <laughs> helps to protect uh, 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 activists from uh, uh, danger because in some areas where, for example, in DRC where you have in conflict area, you, are, you cannot investigate uh, uh, freely. So you, you need some uh, uh, tools that will help you to, to access to, inf the, to, to the information without being in danger. That is uh, one thing that uh, uh, we, we think uh, uh, it's an improvement uh, for for investigator on the field. Thanks, Sasha. Point on that. Add and uh, really underline that it clearly would depend on how how a system is is designed. Certainly, the types of systems that that I'm talking about would be very dependent on whether they are effective at at protecting the anonymity of of folks in the right way. And and I think that underlines the point that you know if, and a good transparency system can't be designed in darkness. You know, you can't have a government say entirely, don't worry, I'm going to set up something great and, and trust us. And I think that's why it's important that it's kind of all the levers that are particularly here at this meeting, whether it's VPAs, whether it's the demand side laws, whether it's NGOs working on zero deforestation commodities and, and tracking it back, that we all kind of come together and, and sit at a table and design systems, help design systems in countries that are particularly sensitive to, to this question and allow interactions of the stakeholders that, that keep them safe. Great. Anyone else have a thought on that or should we go on to another question? Pop another one up. Okay. Second question. Um, what is the real attitude of companies towards no deforestation and the use of these tools? Why is it so hard for them to use tools and achieve their targets? The tools are not even expensive. Maybe you'd like to start with that one, Simona, that same, and you're? Yeah, sure. Um, I think, I mean, I think it's, it's very hard to bundle all companies together. So different companies have different uh, reactions. And I think in general, I mean, the first reaction is, how did you get my data? And it's like, sorry, it's not your data. It's publicly available. We just stitched it together in a way that looks like your data. So um, the reaction is usually very defensive. But there are companies that are more forthcoming. And it's like, OK, let's work together to, to actually showcase that I'm not the one that's creating the problem. They are, are my competitors, right? And to some extent, the the beauty of trace, so to speak, is that everyone's in the picture. So you know that the big six exporters of soy account for 70%, but then you know that there are 200 plus others that account for those 30%. And lots of times those 200 plus are the ones that are more active in, in high deforestation areas than the big six. I mean, usually the big six are always also there. They're everywhere. 
But uh, the point is everyone's in the picture and everyone has the same bar to cross in terms of showcasing your, your superior practices or your sustainable practices. So I think it's, it, we are still at the stage of, of defensiveness, but I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll move into a more proactive uh, reaction from the companies. Well, and you get, as like, um, we get this with governments too, you know, the Global Forest Watch figures for 2017 just came out yesterday, as, as some of you may know, and it's like, you know, who loves us and who hates us depends every year on what the numbers say. It's like, I think Indonesia is pretty much loving us today because it, it showed, you know, things, things, things are doing pretty well there. Other countries not so good, I think they're pretty unhappy about it, you know, and I think you've had that with companies as well, that if a company sees transparency with its information is demonstrating that it is doing a better job in terms of what could be, you know, risk of various kind to it, um, then they will be quite happy being transparent. Others, not so much. Um, anyone else have a comment on that? Really have to all demand from companies that it's actual transparency they're providing. I think they're, they're you know, we have general increased demand for sort of good products and, and we all agree with that. But the question is what are we really focusing that on? Are we allowing companies to kind of get away with, with general statements and lack of actually coughing up real information? And I think that's, I think we need to sharpen our demands. Well, and another thing with these kinds of applications, something from not forestry but from the fisheries side, when ships around Australia and Indonesia used to be able to listen to each other on radios, they would never inform on others who were fishing illegally because the, the one who was being on, informed on would know who was doing the informing. When they begin to get systems where you had security of communication, um, the shrimp, shrimpers, if they see someone some, doing something illegal, they would report them because they knew that they weren't, it, it wasn't going to come back to bite them. So having the security of communication and being able to rely on that I think is also important. For this. Um, Florida, do you have anything on this or should we move on to the next question? Do we have other questions? How we? Yes, we have sí. lots of questions. Do you sí. want to respond al, to this? Sí, al respecto, si le quería comentar que sería importante para nosotros en el país que las empresas asumieran que es su responsabilidad informar transparentemente de lo que están transportando. Mientras no se dé esa transparencia, siempre vamos a tener la problemática de las denuncias que hay contra fiscales que los han investigado. Hay muchos este, procesos de investigación contra fiscales de estos mismos empresarios porque según ellos se, se ven coactados en su trabajo, en su empresa. Incluso en, hay cinco procesos seguidos contra el fiscal de la nación y varios de nosotros fiscales por las investigaciones de estos casos grandes que he mencionado hace un momento. Es importante por eso la transparencia y que la documentación que se entregue en estas investigaciones sean reales. Y solo lo vamos a lograr cuando el gobierno decida de una vez que la trazabilidad debe cumplirse en el tema de la, del transporte de madera, de la comercialización de la madera. Thank you. A very good point. Um, a new question. When will we be able to know with certainty where a sawn or finished wood product is coming from? Good question. I mean, I can take a quick question. Yeah. Um, I would say there's one big problem. There are definitely technologies. Um, we did a project funded by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service last year. Um, for the mass spectrometry technology with their, with their laboratory. And for under $100,000 for everything, we're able to collect 8,000 distinct samples of 3,000 species from around the world, from Kew Gardens and all these reference libraries, to create a complete reference library for mass spectrometry of every species that's listed by the CITES Convention and every similar or lookalike species. And this was done by a postgrad student. Um, uh, she got to fly around the world a lot and collect these things and it was done under budget and under time. So there's now, pretty soon, will be a complete reference library for that particular technology. The catch is a dark mass spec machine costs about $200,000 and you need to know how to operate it. So that's out of reach, you know, in some ways. Uh, stable isotope, there's a lot of these things. It's all about collecting the reference database that you can compare your samples to, just like with fingerprints. Uh, having access to the technology that you need to actually do the analysis, 
um, and having a system for sampling and monitoring that, that is reliable to prepare the samples, even for wood anatomy. And so I think that, yes, we can do this now for certain species in certain places. Certain people have that capacity. With some, it's pretty difficult. Looking at rosewood and ebony in Madagascar, it's something we spent a lot of time on. There's probably only three people on Earth who can tell the ebony species apart. And when they were doing a survey two years ago on one small island in Madagascar, they found 12 new species that they didn't know existed of, of ebony is growing on this one island. Um, so it depends on what species you're talking about. We're doing big leaf maple right now with volunteers in the western United States. There was just an article about this in the New York Times the other day. Um, a group called Adventure Scientists, they train citizen scientists and they're collecting samples to create a DNA database of big leaf maple. And we're doing that much more as a test case in an easier environment, because even I can tell a maple tree. I mean, it's very hard to tell apart, say, say rosewood trees and things like that. So it, I guess the answer is it really depends. A lot more is going to have to go into these technologies for it to work. Um, but there is some stuff that can be used right now. I believe Sasha mentioned that um, the stable isotope analysis of location was a key piece of the work in one of the biggest cases under the Lacey Act a few years ago. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts on that one. <laughs> I'm so eager. I'll go ahead and please anybody jump in. But I, the, what I'm eager about is to make the point that I think is often not made that really sawmills around the world right now are getting away with murder in, in not committing in any way towards tracking where the actual, w what's coming out at the end compared to what came in. Everything I've talked about so far are the extraordinary opportunities that countries have to really beef up the information in terms of where individual logs come from so you can distinguish whether they're from inside the national park, whether they're legal or illegal. The sawmills around the world right now are systematically, the whether they want to be or not, the laundering mechanism for the world's wood because they insist to date that it is absolutely impossible when presented with a log that has a beautiful barcode on it and everybody worked really hard to figure out where it's from, we could not possibly keep track of that information for a two by four that's coming out the other end. And I mean, well-meaning sawmill operators absolutely argue with me that is impossible, but I, I am not convinced that that is impossible. I've been to these sawmills that, you know, the ones in Romania, of course, are the top and they uh, have a, a laser machine that, that checks every log as it comes in to know exactly how big it is. They keep digital photographs of every log for six months, uh, all for quality control. But they say it would be totally impossible for us to keep track of where the log actually came from for the two by four that comes out. I think if we uh, demand that of sawmills, I mean, the other great injustice it causes is that if you have a community who is producing a, a product out of wood, a, a, a more manufactured product, they are now not getting any benefit of that. They are able to t tell you exactly where that manufactured product comes from, but the market does not, is not giving them really the, the, the benefit for that because the whole world is saying that that, that is impossible. So demand of sawmills and, and, and push them to at least, if they could, tell you where their, what tree their two by four came from, I think because of the value jump that that represents, it would be somewhat of a revolution. Thanks. Uh, I mean, trace is, is quite complementary to these other technologies in the sense that we map the middle of the supply chain. So we have a jurisdictional level, um, so we don't know where within that municipality the, the commodity came from, and we don't know who's the, the household that bought it. But by mapping the middle of the supply chain at scale, we can actually help um, prioritize areas uh, of high risk, for example, for further investigation. So for example, um, by looking at, uh, we are working with, with different um, uh, buying companies in Europe and they want to know where they are sourcing from and then to investigate further within those municipalities what are the farms that have issues or how could they actually be uh, improve their practices so by looking at trace we won't know the farm but we will know which place in Brazil which uh, combination of municipalities ha uh, has um, sent uh, soy to these uh, companies and therefore you can actually help uh, downscale the problem significantly. So you have the whole supply chain at that level, and then you can get and zoom in to the two, three, four, five municipalities that you could have major issues on. 
So that where is also H. depends. Right? Do you have another point on that? Uh, I just want to, to, to add something to, to what you said. Last year, we attended a, a workshop uh, with uh, the U.S. Department of Justice where they present uh, uh, one uh, uh, technique to identify uh, the origin of uh, wood species. It, it is a DNA uh, uh, analysis. But the problem is it is possible to know, but when <laughs> That's not sure because uh, uh, in Africa, at least uh, they told us that there are only two persons that are able to run uh, uh, such analysis. So you can imagine if you want to have such information, how long it can take to, for you to, to have it. And the cost is uh, something that uh, you will not be able to afford. That's why uh, <laughs> I... I I can just say, yes, it is possible, but the cost. <laughs> just this week, the Global Timber Tracking Network, which is a network supported by the German government and European Forest Institute managers, are doing an Africa regional workshop on wood identification technologies in Cameroon. Um, it's going on this very week. And um, if you're interested in this particular topic, go to the GTTN web website, Global Timber Tracking Network. They've got a lot of information on this. It's an international network of experts in different parts of the world who work specifically on wood identification, and we're involved in just sort of help, helping them manage it. But it's, a, it's very interesting, everywhere from you know, the U.S., and, and there are some in Africa who are doing some, some, some good work, and, but it is expensive, and the DNA is particularly requires a level of technical expertise and the equipment around it that makes it, it's very accurate, but it's very, it, it is the high end. So should we have one more question? Is there any other c comments on this one? Or we have 11 minutes left, so we can do a couple more. Ah. I think this will be one for you, Sasha. Um, how scalable is Romania's wood app, either to other geographies or commodities, and what would it cost? Um, I, I, I think it's extremely scalable. and. Um, I make sure to point out that the designer of that system is actually in the room, Bogdan Michu. I don't know if you want to hey, stand up briefly because hey, he will be, I think, available right uh, afterwards. And yeah, yeah. I, I should mention that right when this, this finishes in 11 minutes, if you go around the corner to the Lofoten room, which is down the hallway where those are, you can see a lot of these things in action. We're setting up tables and computers, and you'll get a chance to look at the Romanian app. You'll get a chance to look at some of the Global Forest Watch related ones, the Open Timber Portal that was mentioned, uh, Trace, are all going to be there. So if you grab a cup of coffee and go around the corner, you can see how these work. So, I mean, in, in my first comment, our sense is that it's extremely scalable to the extent that the, the core ideas are that a government has this requirement that before you start moving, you uh, register a travel permit with your smartphone, you take advantage of the current low cost of smartphones to fundamentally change what you can see in the forest, to have that first information actually be true, that, that all of our subsequent efforts to trace both commodities and timber products are, are based on. Um, I, it, it would be uh, quite inexpensive in that, uh, it, you know, the, those basic fundamentals are, are not based on any kind of a particular system. You need some sort of database. Many countries would already have a database that is uh, trying to, for example, digitize their concessions, which would allow that system, which then immediately spits out a number and says, yes, you are allowed to move wood around, to have that system be smart, meaning that it real-time checks what concession is it from, how much has, has already been cut in that concession, um, that would be the, the key investment would, have, would be for that database to be done well. Um, but then uh, with that level of political will, it would be, if you're starting from scr scratch, probably in the low hundreds of thousands for a country to, to set up the system if they, if they had the political will. Um, and, and I don't see any reason with in, in issues of, of whether you have cell phone coverage and so forth, the, the, the key elements of a country wanting to have that level of transparency, if they want it, in their forest, it can happen right now anywhere in the world, is my take. Great. So I think what we'll do, we have nine minutes left. Why don't we put up one more question, and I'll go to everybody, and you have, will have the choice of either responding to the question which is up there, or if you'd like to say something else, some concluding thoughts, please do. You don't have to be 
bound by the question. We'll see what it says. Ah, it's for Peru. So this one <laughs> is definitely the floor. Are there efforts underway among prosecutors in the region or globally to ensure these technologies are used more regularly in cases? How do you cooperate with other prosecutors in other countries to try and improve the, the use of these tools and technologies? Sí, tenemos diversos acuerdos y hemos trabajado de manera binacional con Colombia y con Ecuador para el uso de estas tecnologías y hemos trabajado incluso operativos en conjunto de manera simultánea y cada quien en su espacio ha podido intervenir en temas de deforestación y tala ilegal. También tenemos un acuerdo con Brasil para encontrarnos ahora en el mes de julio en Iquitos para ver el uso de estas tecnologías y poder nosotros determinar, porque según los fiscales de Brasil, la madera de Brasil está siendo blanqueada en Perú y según los fiscales de Perú, nuestra madera está siendo blanqueada en Brasil. Entonces, está, vamos, tenemos esta reunión que se va a llevar a cabo en el mes de julio entre fiscales de Brasil y de Perú de, de la frontera, de la triple frontera y también hemos invitado a los fiscales de Colombia a fin de poder nosotros trabajar juntos y ver cuál es la documentación que se requiere en cada, en cada país y explicarles a ellos qué es lo que deben de observar de la documentación de Perú, porque según nos dicen, la documentación que, ellos, que presentan es documentación que para, es verdadera, se supone, por los sellos que tienen. Sin embargo, nosotros vamos a tener dos días de, de capacitación a los fiscales brasileros con personal de OSINFOR, con personal de CERFOR, de, las, de los gobiernos regionales para explicarles cuál documento que están presentando y que está acreditando que esa madera es legal realmente es falsificada. Entonces, sí tenemos trabajos y creo que tenemos que seguir encontrándonos y desarrollando este tipo de trabajos con nuestros pares, hablando de fiscales, de los diferentes países que nos rodean, ¿no? con quienes tenemos frontera. Igual, igualmente estamos trabajando con Ecuador, que ya hemos tenido varias reuniones binacionales, y con Bolivia, pero en Bolivia nuestra, nuestra preocupación no es tanto la deforestación, sino el tema de la minería ilegal. Pero sí trabajamos y hacemos uso de, de nuestras unidades de georreferenciación para explicar que esa madera que se está, está comercializando o está pasando hacia, el, hacia ese lado, según nuestra información, ha salido de zonas donde no está permitida el, la, tala, la tala de madera. Thank you very much. So for the others, whether thoughts about Peru or anything, just some final thoughts. We have just four minutes left or so, so each a minute or two for the other three of you. A particular th last parting thought you'd like to leave with the group? Yeah. I, I think that uh, uh, something that we I have not raised uh, uh, during my, my, my speech is the, the fact that some of the tools that uh, we need uh, or we use uh, to be able to, to, to implement or to use them efficiently, we need uh, uh, to have the, the government or the, the, the administration on board because uh, um, some of these uh, uh, have some in interface where the information go directly to the, the administration and the they are the ones who are supposed to act uh, after they receive the information because the, the monitors doesn't have the power, the legal power to, to arrest or to, to... So we need a, a clear political will uh, in the side of the government to, to see things improving and to have the administration uh, uh, on board in the process of uh, what we call dematerialization of uh, process in administration because in, in our countries, Cameroon, they, they used to say uh, administration, you, you cannot uh, 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 
require an action from the administration without writing. <laughs> and you know, by writing, you, you, it will take so much time to reach uh, uh, the, the, the target that with these tools and technology, they are able to receive on a real time, nearly real time uh, 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 limit information and to be able to act. So what we also need to, to put an, uh, an emphasis on is the, the political will to mm -hmm. see things uh, change and improve. Good point. Sasha, you got a minute for us, a final thought? One, um, I would just really underline that, that point of, of the political will and finding a way to automate and, and you know, make official the participation of civil society monitors such as yourself so that the action is not one that you hope for but one that happens and you see it happen in real time. And I wanted to also um, really compliment the efforts and underline the importance of the efforts in Peru right now where it's an it's a extraordinary example of a situation where really the entire information as you described, Flora, that was trying to describe the forest sector was, was wrong, right? I mean, the, the entire paperwork that was describing shipments around the entire country was totally decoupled from reality, meaning it was saying the wood was coming from a place where it was not coming from. And, no, and, and the challenge that that creates for how to then manage your forests and, and be specific about where you are should cut and where you shouldn't cut, it's disastrous. So, so the potential to fix that problem and create a basis of information now that is truth, where a tree is actually cut where it says it is cut, is I think a revolution that uh, has, could have a great, a great future. And, and I think that is a, a tipping point where, where Peru stands at the moment. Thanks. And the last word goes to you, Simona. We're just oh, sure. nosotros estamos esperando que estas unidades georreferenciales que están, están trabajándose a través de unos de los ingenieros eh, quienes emiten informes as, estos informes sean considerados pericias para nosotros es muy importante y es lo que estamos trabajando ahora que la fiscalía o el fiscal de la nación decida de una vez que nosotras podamos utilizar como prueba fehaciente en el proceso, como una pericia, los informes de estos ingenieros que manejan las unidades georreferenciales. Es muy importante, porque ahorita solo nosotros los tenemos como un informe, como una, un apoyo, una ayuda en el proceso penal que nosotros seguimos contra estas empresas. Entonces, lo, lo que nosotros necesitamos es que estos informes sean considerados pericias y hemos trabajado a través de, de ACA, tres consultorías relacionadas a este tipo de información que requieren los fiscales. Entonces, también está en nuestra parte impulsar dentro de nuestra misma institución que de una vez ya se le dé la oportunidad a la, al, al fiscal de contar con una pericia que sea, em, sea emitida por estos ingenieros que manejan estas unidades georreferenciales. Y también necesitamos el apoyo de los, del, un grupo de peritos que trabaja para la coordinación, pero son tan pequeños que a nivel nacional tenemos seis y, y hemos propuesto la descentralización de, de cuatro grupos de peritos para que los fiscales puedan acceder de manera inmediata e ir con ellos en los operativos o llevarlos a juicio para que sean la base de, nuestras, de, de nuestros procesos, ¿no? Ese es un trabajo que estamos realizando ahorita y que esperamos que muy pronto pueda llevarse ya, llegar a realizar el señor fiscal de la Nación, sacar la resolución de la Fiscalía de la Nación que los considere peritos y cuya documentación sea presentada en juicio y no pueda ser cuestionada. Ese es algo que estamos trabajando también con el tema de la modernidad dentro de la institución y en el área de materia ambiental. Thank you very much. So, you have the last word, Simona. This says we're over time, but my phone says we still have a minute. So. <laughs>
I'd say, well, the, the, my last message is that transparency is here to stay and supply chain actors will be held accountable for their actions and either they can do that by kicking and screaming and prosecution or by leading the way and being forthcoming and collaborating with these uh, transparency initiatives. So I think that, that it's up to each, each uh, individual company or government in terms of defining priorities and how to move along the, the, the path of transparency and accountability. And just as a final word, I'd like to invite everyone to the launch of the yearbook today at 5.30 at the Literature House. So thank you. Thank you. We'll be there. Well, I would like to um, first, before getting to the panelists, thank Lisa and Frida down front here. Frida from McPhee and Lisa from EIA, who really organized this whole thing and helped us to get it together and have been keeping track of the notes. So thank you very much for that. And thank you in general to, for, for inviting us here in Norway to this great event. Thanks to all of you on the panel. I thought it was fascinating, really interesting, different experiences. And so let's give them a hand. And And as I noted, if you grab a cup of coffee or tea, just around the corner in Lofoten Room, I, I think it is nicely set up now. If, you, if you'd like to actually see some of these things in action, um, whether the Romanian system or Trace or other things, we'll be over there and you know, we'll be you know, signing albums and handing out t-shirts and all those kinds of things. <laughs>